Hello and welcome to our brand new podcast, Rollmongers Presents Dice Before Dishonor. But before we jump right into War for the Crown, maybe some of you have, it's been out all month, we thought we would go on a binge. As promised, the Glass Cannon Podcast, Mr. Troy the Valley, we have picked up your gauntlets as you threw down on the ground in cannon fodder. To surprise Joe O'Brien and his amazing little halfling cavalier, we have decided to put forth in War for the Crown a podcast actual play, play test, play a little prologue for you to see if a party mainly consisting, if not completely consisting of cavaliers, would actually work. So now we bring you Honor's Echo, a Pathfinder Society adventure, which consists of six mini quests. The last one bringing in major players of the Taldor court to see if these guys can fight the good fight in around the country, schmooze with the best of them, and still come out like a regular party, if not better. Perhaps worse. We will find out. Let me go around the room for our cast of players. First, on my DM's assistant chair, on my side of the chair, we have Mr. Aiden Willems. You know him from our Star Wars Actual Play podcast. We shot first as Poser Sham, our Jedi in hiding. He also plays the dark and brooding sorcerer Vraskin under Clinton Shard in Clinton's Core Classics, Pathfinder's Rise of the Rune Lords, another podcast actual play that Rollmongers puts out that you should check out both in your spare time. Tonight, and until somebody dies or leaves the podcast, he belongs to me, our resident rule lawyer for the defense, Mr. Aiden Willem. Whoa, uh, uh, uh. Uh, time to kill the party. Hey, how's it going? Next up, speaking of rules lawyers, a man that I have, well, shall we say, relied heavily on in the world of rules, Mr. J. Tamlin, prosecutor for, well, the prosecution who likes to debate the rules, but pulls out them true, and we can actually brand ourselves rules as written, role mongers raw. Playing tonight? I practiced the law. I practically perfected it. Mr. J. Tamlin? Rolling down the list, the lead in our Star Wars cast, playing Raul Obris, the noble, the man with the plan tonight, Mr. Matt Witt. Sally, hell! How's everybody doing? And of course, without Matt, we bring his faithful sidekick, but tonight, not a sidekick, a peer, perhaps even more forthrunning. The funniest man in the room, the guy with the best comeback, and lick every wall, Mr. Ryan Messina. How's it going? Where's your wall? Hey, it's going to become my friend. To complete our dynamic duo, a late comer to role mongers, but a man who has always held his own and fantastic in the role playing aspect of exposition of anything you hand him on a sheet, expanding it, crunching it, and making it his own, Mr. Frank Hamilton. That was a dramatic pause. Thank you, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope to give you something uh, really great. Now, we have one more surprise for you. Playing under myself, a GM of his own caliber, the man that runs Clinton's Core Classics, Clinton Shard himself from Rise of Rune Lords. Thank you so much for joining us as a player tonight. I am back for the very first time. That's All true. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's making his debut as a player for Rollmongers instead of running. I uh, used to be playing under him in Rise of Rune Lords, but tonight, tonight you belong to me. The tables have turned. So, gentlemen... There is so much to explain for people to wrap their heads around. Let us start briefly, as we can, with Taldor. If, and I highly recommend you listen to Cannon Fodder episode 87, where Crystal Fraser, the lead director on the War for the Crown adventure path, has been interviewed thoroughly by the GCP. She can tell you quite a bit about her vision for this, where she's going with this. Be sure to check them out. But tonight, we're going to tell you a little bit about Taldor. If someone had to compare this to our own history, let's go back. Hundreds of years, thousands of years. I'm getting a sense of Rome. They landed, they civilized, they built good roads, good aqueducts, and expanded and had all these mini crusades off into different territories all around Taldor. Boom, 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 boom. Expand, expand, expand. They have a long lasting feud with neighboring countries, but we'll get into that later. Now they've elevated themselves to sort of a French snobby court where the nobles dine and refine. The Senate bogs most things down in red tape and the common man is really looking for some new blood, something new. There's a special vote about to happen in the Taldorian court where they're trying to remove the fact that a ruling heir must be a man. Unfortunately, Prince Stavian III, our current ruler, had a son who died. Terrible accent. But he has a daughter. Princess, well, you know what? 
How about we just drop you right into the action? Welcome to Taldor. Welcome to Dice Before Dishonor. Politics abound will come at the players. But for right now, gentlemen, for whatever reason you may or may not know each other, you have been brought together by a man who wishes to regain his noble status. Romero Alcasti claims to have had an ancestor in the past, risen to greatness, a war hero, and was cast down by former rulers. He wishes to re-elevate her status and hence, obviously, elevate his own. But before he can do that, he needs evidence. He sends you a parte of six handwritten letters and the money you need to travel to different places to garner this evidence in his steed. Adventure abounds as you will travel deep into the Verdant Forest, to the museum farm outside of Elmas, into the own Acasti tomb, right into the main capital itself of Opara, to the last bastion of Arden. Talk to priests, talk to commoners, talk to nobles, and even across the way, Quadrit. But first, gentlemen, let's go around the room and talk about your characters, your cavaliers, paladins, and wait, even have a fly samurai just to mix things up a little bit. Top of the list, let's start with the purest of the pure cavaliers that I can find in this group. Mr. Frank Hamilton, tell us about your cavalier, sir. Well, uh, technically one of the lords of Blackwater, so that's a far-flung barony in eastern Taldor. I'll be playing Samish Gildervarth Stavian, and he's the kind of guy that, you know, although born into nobility, he kind of wants not a whole lot to do with it, seeing it as a truly ruinous event in Taldor. So he'll say that, uh, you know, only catastrophe would give him the reins of responsibility. Now, I believe one of the things in the player's handbook allows you guys to take feats and attach yourself to important noble families. Would you say as a cavalier, that's about as far as you go working for the military and actually, or have you actually attached yourself to any family? Oh uh, yeah. He's actually um, a distant cousin to the crown prince. Oh, bless you, sir. Goes right for the juggler. Yep. So he's got the Stavian name. So he would have inherited it on his mother's side. So no way he can inherit the throne. But you can still drop the name. That's right. It's all, all, right. About, it's all about name dropping. Next, Mr. Clinton Shard, Frank's friend of real life, a DM around the Saturday night meat table. These guys came as a package deal to Rollmongers and neither have disappointed. Clinton, tell us about your character. Well, I'm uh, Gordas Tapo. I'm an ex-soldier that has come from a dishonored nobility family. A great calamity happened to his family and his family had been disgraced. They're now uh, persona non grata. So um, I tried to hide that heritage as much as I possibly can, but I'm this, I'm a young grizzled soldier who uh, uses bow rather than ride a horse per se. And so I, as a castellan, I want to defend local families and I've came across the lion's order and I felt that that was the most appropriate, which is, well, we can get into that later in the game, I suppose. Now, not to be confused with the Taldarian order, the Lion's yes. Blades. This is the Cavalier the order. order. Lion of the order. Okay, just to be clear. Yeah. All yes. right. Next on the chopping block, we have Mr. Matt Witt playing. Now, so far we've been dipping into the human pond, I'm assuming, because no one's stated the race, so we're yes, all de facto right. humans. Human. Yes, de facto both. human so far. Mr. Matt Witt. Okay, so uh, I am playing Winston, the portly he is a halfling beast rider, cavalier, order of the paw. Uh, he's sworn to uh, defend the, ha the various halfling settlements on the outskirts of Talador because obviously the local human population doesn't really view them as being um, of equal right, <laughs> so to speak. So they don't look after the halfling settlements, so somebody's got to pick up the slack, and that's, that's what the order of the paw does. I ride a wolf. Is it a uh, magical wolf? It's not a magical wolf. Okay, that's maybe, good. Maybe one day it will be. We just had to make that clear. You hear that? No magical wolves. Okay. No, just just a regular old ordinary wolf that I ride. Can he go up and downstairs? Sorry, he I can notice. actually quite fluently. He can charge up and down. So you actually have the advantage of having a small character, but on a medium mount where you can actually squeeze in places indoors where guys on a great big four square horse, a large creature cannot. Yes. Well, Winston the Portly requires this because he, he's really not good at getting around on his own. Um, Hence, quite the rotund. <laughs> Hence the Portly. Quite rotund. In fact, it doesn't even look like he has anything above the knees because his belly just laps right past them. Okay. That should be very interesting. Bringing us to our next exotic character, the alternate to Cavalier is the Samurai, so technically perfectly legal to play one, as far as we're concerned. Mr. J. Talon, tell us about your fly Samurai guy. 
どうぞよろしくお願いいたしますと。Is this why people scream at you speak English because you Japanese <laughs> come out in pieces? That was really embarrassing. That was really embarrassing.、Uh, for those that know, Jay Tamlin actually can speak Japanese when we don't put a microphone and like a camera on him. So, without subtitles, because this is a podcast, you know, I don't think people yeah, can、yeah. see the subtitles.、Uh, no, my character's name is Haruyuki Setsuna, and generally he goes by Leon. His family came to Opara about probably about 10 to 15 years ago.、Uh, he and his mother ended up getting attached to the Vinmark family. Okay, and what are they known for?、Uh, they are the Ulfen Norse people that came in and are a newly established family. We kind of got attached because they are the ones that took us here and they have my stuff. Oh, sort of like a reverse、uh, Jade Regent, where in Jade Regent you start in v e r i s i a go up through the Northlands and deal with the Ulfans and then come down into Zaitan. You kind of like came up through Zaitan, dealt with the Ulfans. They took your stuff, you said? Yeah, Mum says that my family has escaped some kind, of, some kind of war or something. And in running away, we had to get attached to the Ulfan people and they brought us here. Ah, so the family holding secrets from you. That'll probably be brought out to light to you, let alone to us in the future. And you are playing a samurai. Next,、yes. we have another fighter, another warrior for the common man, another servant class. Ryan, tell us about your character. I'm、uh, playing Bartholomew Donald Duggan, cavalier extraordinaire, a little more yelly than your average kind of cavalier. But that's only because he's been really put through the grinder, so to speak. He's a half o l which in Taldor isn't really smiled on, not just because it's tough. Yeah, you're part of the servant class, as it were. Yeah, so that's why he spent his entire life in the military academy ever since his birth. Grandpa, once he found out about Bartholomew's birth, pretty much made sure the mum wasn't an issue.、Uh, she was sent away. And due to the fact that he is a Dunaldagon, it is a lesser noble family. But still, a Dunaldagon, that kind of a shame had to be taken responsibility for, and so was probably put into a proper cause. And the best way that they saw that Bartholomew could serve the family would be in a military career, and hopefully he could die a glorious battle at the very least and, and bring the family. Shipped you off to military school, and hopefully you die in a terrible military accident and they'd be rid of you. Exactly. That's terrible. I love、uh, it. Your, your family's awful. This is wonderful. That's a Taldorian noble for you. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, welcome to Taldor, and we will begin your adventure now. Prologue of Six Parts Honors Echo, a Pathfinder Society adventure. Set just prior to our War for the Crown adventure path, which will introduce our band of cavaliers to the inner sea region setting of Taldor and its dangers both afield and within the political arena. Four millennia, magnificent Taldor reigned as an enduring empire praised for its culture, military wealth, and connections to the glory of Aslant. By the beginning of the fifth millennium AR, Taldor had begun to sag under the weight of its excessive ceremony and decadence. Its old rival, Kadiria, led an invasion against its declining neighbor in the year 4079. Sensing an opportunity, many of Taldor's western provinces declared their independence in what was called the Elven Tongued Conquest. A war. On two fronts that the Empire could not handle. Taldor repelled the Kadarian forces and it never regained its lost lands again. In the aftermath of the war, emperors of Taldor sought scapegoats to bear the shame of their defeat. They stripped numerous noble families of their titles and lands to condemn their failures in the two campaigns. Most who suffered this punishment faded into obscurity and never rose again. For an ambitious few, reclaiming the titles they should have inherited is an all consuming goal. Countess Honeria Alcasti was an influential commander during the campaigns before and immediately following the Elven Tongue Conquest, yet all her skill could not make up for the shortage of supplies, and her career came to an ignoble end. When she dared to critique the crown strategies, the emperor sentenced her family to a life as the common people. 
Now, many years later, her many times great-grandson, Romeo Alcasti, has incomplete references to his ancestor's heroism and title. As he longs to exonerate her name and regain the noble title that he believes he deserves. If he can gather the right evidence and present it in Opara, he is certain he will succeed and regain that title. He needs our cavaliers to help follow his leads across several countries to uncover the truth and the evidence in hand to advocate for his ancestor's grand legacy. Welcome to Dice Before Dishonor. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rollmonger's Actual Play Podcast presents Dice Before Dishonor. Tonight, our prologue series begins where we are playing Season 8, one of the last modules listed. It is set in and around Taldor, and you get to meet several of the major NPCs that arrive, and the players get to schmooze in Crownfall. So, live or die. Make it or break it, our party, completely consisting of mainly cavaliers, samurai, cavalier, alternates, or whatever, we're going to see if our promise can be kept, if we can do this. Welcome to Honor's Echo Prologue Part 1. Now, if you have listened to our clip, you have already listened to me introducing the cast of players, as well as me introducing the cast of characters with a little bit of backstory discussing how certain nobles that got, shall we say, dethroned uh, by the major nobility as a scapegoat during the Elven Tongue War, some of them, their descendants, want a piece of the pie again. They want back up there, including your current benefactor, your employer for this evening, Mr., as you can see here, Romeo Alcasti. For the podcast audience, all I can describe this guy is, is um, hmm, Mercutio comes to mind of Shakespeare. You have the typical puffy hat with the one feather coming out the front long sideways. Wonderful striped balloon pants with the later hosen uh, down below. A rapier to side. And the proverbial Santa Claus looking cape with the white fur trim and red doffed off one shoulder. Puffy sleeves. And this guy is a throw up color menagerie of gold, reds, and burgundies. Did I miss anything? He has no. a beard. Oh, he... a red. Yes, he does. He has a red beard <laughs> and a perplexed look on his face like he could really make things happen in this capital or is possible as a man possible of anything because he's a man with strong apparitions, an agenda and a strong monobrow and a strong monobrow, which makes him twice as formidable. <laughs> so. His Gentle. disappointment never ends. <laughs> the disappointment never ends. <laughs> is that like the song that never ends? This is a disappointment that never ends, no? All right. <laughs> Drawing your attention to the handout section, gentlemen, we are going to start with letters that you have received. You have each received a copy of each of these six. However, you do notice that penned at the top in sort of an afterthought, one of the six copies has something more personable to each of you. Let's begin with the first letter that goes to Frank's character, Lord Samish Gildervarth. Do you care to read aloud, sir? No. 
yeah. <laughs> if you want Hang allies on, just on this trip, it might be a really good <laughs> idea. That it, it it like it just populated for me. Oh, okay. Hi hi yeah. Where are the letters? I'm looking, looking. No. Is this the one that says greetings? Earlier, is is that the correct one? Earlier in her military career. Yep. Sure. Okay. Greetings. Earlier in her military career, my ancestor, Honoria, received knightly honors from the Church of Eroden. Although Eroden's blessings may not seem like such a great honor now, it was with tremendous prize before his death, particularly for a person as young as she was at the time. A bronze bust commemorating the occasion still rests in the vaults below the Basilica of the Last Man. I don't believe that it's properly guarded there, and I would like your help in convincing the erudites to re relinquish it to me. Once you have returned the bust to me, I will ensure that you are generously rewarded for your time. And that is a sign sincerest thanks, Romero Alacasti. I don't sound like that, not in the slightest. The man himself appears in the doorway of the gentleman's parlor where the five of you have been dwelling, exchanging letters, and deciding if this is actually legit or some sort of hoax. Doffing his cap, showing a shock of red curly hair to, to match the beard, dusting off the travel of the road. Somewhere in the heart of a para, a select wine-tasting parlor of a subnoble has let you guys sort of camp out for the afternoon to compare these letters, bring yourselves together, and what is this? The man who wrote them appears in the doorway. Greetings, my friends. I thought to legitimize and possibly sweeten the deal, shall we say, I would accompany you to the church, the bastion of the last man, the Belisiga, and introduce you to Brother Velikus myself. I have petitioned him constantly over these few months to have him return the bus to my care and my family to no but any uh, frustrating end would you accompany me and we shall see if we can set this right once and for all and prove to you gentlemen that i am sincere in this endeavor and he kind of makes a circling motion you know encompassing the five of you all as well as encompassing the fact that all the other letters talking about other places he wishes you to go, the man puts in an appearance. What say you? Well, of course, you may count me in. Wherever my companions go, I shall go as well. <laughs> Pretty, of course. Travel with my friends. Is, is that it? Travel with your friend? Okay. Yes, we shall go. Wonderful. I'm glad you've taken the time to get acquainted. I had heard rumors, and I have to admit, I did a little bit of vetting. I hope you'll excuse me, he says, clutching his hands sort of gingerly in a prayer fashion, folding his cap. I know some of you may not know each other personally, but I was hoping you would get along and hit it off regally in astute fashion. And it seems you have, he says, spreading his arms wide in a grand fashion. Bully. Shall we go? My carriage awaits outside. I shall meet you at the Belicia of the Last Man. It is a church to Aerodin. Sounds like our host is offering to pay for the meal, boys. Oh, I'm never one for turning down a meal. <laughs> That's good on you push myself up and big hand on the shoulder. I like you already. For a podcasting audience at home, going around the room quickly as each man exits to either enter the carriage with El Casti or don his own horse, starting left to right on our Roll20 screen with Frank. Can you describe the man that's following in line behind your benefactor, Romero sure. El Casti? Well, my character is uh, Lord Samish Gildervarth. Um, he's uh, just shy of six feet, kind of slightly built, not not too heavy. Uh, sandy blonde hair, 
uh, no real facial hair, but you know, maybe the, the five o'clock shadow, but he's got very, he's very nicely dressed. I mean, obviously he comes from money. Perhaps he doesn't have it himself, but his family did look after him at one point in time. Uh, his armor's up to snuff. His weapons are very finely polished and taken care of. Uh, kind of what you would expect from a, a, an aspiring knight. Awesome. Now, as I said before, the clip that we've already aired uh, goes into these characters in a little bit more detail, but I wouldn't mind if you happen to have dropped the name or role-playing hint of the trait that you took tying yourself into the campaign. Okay. Um, so my character is related to the Stetvian family, and that is, although distantly related, he is you know, he can, can trace his lineage to the crown prince. So distant relation of the biggest family on campus. The biggest family, yeah. All right. Next through the doorway, stepping out into the lit street, Leon. Uh, about five, six, very, very light build. Like couldn't be more than 150, 130, maybe even. Um Otherwise, his armor is also similarly immaculate, but nowhere near as fancy. It's just a bunch of leather, but it does look quite la quite well lacquered. Um, strung across his back is, I, it looks like a piece of wood, uh, but it's probably most likely an unstrung bow. Um, he has a very determined look upon his face, and as you as we walk through the hallway, he's always stopping and greeting the uh, greeting the various passerbys that he meets. Um, shaking the hands and never quite seems to not know someone. Oh, so you're kissing hands and shaking babies? Or shaking hands and kissing babies as you go? Are we setting ourselves up for the... Don't shake the baby. <laughs> Sorry. My GCP is showing. Um, you obviously are glad handing the public is what you're saying. Oh, I'm not glad handing. I, I legitimately seem to know pretty much everyone. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's a lot of winking and pointing and almost finger yeah. gunning the odd guy, the baker, the candlestick maker. Exactly. All right. Next, we have Mr. Tapo. Hi, I'm Clinton, and uh, I'm playing a Talden Castellan Cavalier. This is more of a city defender soldier style Cavalier. Uh, he uh, it comes from a well, his background is not to be discussed. When uh, he was sitting around with the other nobles, he kept very quiet. He didn't really speak up much. I mean, he's he's personable and likable. He just doesn't want to talk about his background. Okay. The, so the sign at Sandpoint drops in your face. What do we see? What do you see? You see a six-foot, brown-haired, brown, brown blue-eyed, fair-skinned, uh, a little more fair than normal for a Talden. Uh, he's around 35 and uh, six foot and weighs about 190 pounds, wearing chain mail, uh, long sword strapped to his side, a nice little dagger and a composite longbow. Looks like the longbow has seen lots of use. All right. He does not wear spurs on his boots. <laughs> no spurs, no mount. Just give him a good castle wall. Right. That's right. Next. Winston. The portly. Winston the portly, yeah. So what you see is uh, uh, when you look down is about a three foot tall, 100 uh, pound halfling wearing scale mail. Um, now, you guys. I'm sorry, did you say 100 uh, pounds? 100 he, pounds. He like bangs down the hallway. He's, he's, <laughs> he's as round as he is tall. That's that is amazing. That that's a hell of a half thing. Okay. Has to wear dwarven armor. Your poor uh, man. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's not it's only a hundred pounds. And speaking of mounts, um, you guys don't see him right now, but you know of him due to my fame in the uh, in the barrel racing competitions of sport in the arena. <laughs> um, I'm well known for my uh, unique mount. The athletic star I'm sensing from the PC guide. And uh, yes, Buckley is famous for this wolf that can stand on two legs. Barkley. Barkley, sorry. Stand on two legs and pick this halfling up by the feet and watch the halfling hands go like mad as they barrel race. 
Was that well, sorry? You did say no, barrel no. Racing. Bar- it's barrel racing, but that you're thinking wheel barrel race. Barrel racing is no, when sorry. they put the the three barrels in the arena and you have to do the the pattern around it. It's a race. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, like a, small... a time trial. Yeah, sorry. Western barrel racing. Sorry, you said yes. barrel, and yeah, my brain went right to the shenanigans of and, and wheel barrel. Well, I'm you know I'm not known for being some mighty jousting champion. I do hold the fastest time in all of civilized Tullador. Oh, very nice. A boast that is. And last but not least, bringing up the rear of this unusual party, Bartholomew. That's uh, Bartholomew Dunaldagon, a proud member of the Dunaldagon family. But um, I've been in military camp my whole life, though. Um, military man. I, what do you look like? I'm 6'5", 220 pounds, clad in armor from top to bottom, and with an assortment of weapons from a battle axe to a sword. To a hunk of wood over my shoulder that to the unastute eye literally literally looks like a stump. <laughs> okay. Anything else stand out about you, sir? Uh, other than the gun show? I was referring to your teeth. Oh, no, well, he's... It definitely is not fully human. His half-orc heritage definitely shows. He's got a uh, reddish... Well, you can always tent, hide it under a bucket helm. I'm just curious if it's apparent. Nope, no helmet. Proud about this. Okay. Uh, he's got, he has some tusks. Not big tusks. Um, it's it's an obstacle I have to work over. It's but okay. the family yeah, it, will acknowledge me. Yeah, that's, that's fine. It's not the size of your tusks. It's how you use your lance. Yeah, that's or, some good authority. Or club. <laughs> or, or <laughs> the guy with the short, short Dude. Lance. All right. Out- it starts early. All right. Yes. Outside. Uh, Romeo is a gentleman and holds the door of his carriage for Tapo, who has no mount. I believe the rest of you all actually have your own personal mounts, yes? Yes. All right, going back, first out of the door with Samish, can you describe your magnificent mount? Now, just a quick DM thing here. There's a lot of debate about what a cavalier gets, and they get a horse. If you get a large war horse, that's an advanced template, and that's something that you kind of get into at the sort of third, fourth level. So mm-hmm. in a nutshell, there's the bestiary horse, ladies and gentlemen. Then they advanced template the sucker, and you get this massive draft horse or like a, you know, a war horse. It's amazing. But for a druid companion or a.k.a. the cavalier that gets one, your horses are kind of nerfed out of the gate. But by the time you guys hit second, third, fourth level, you are on par with a regular man's horse. And then after that, from that level on to 20th, Look out, these horses will be doing your taxes, flying around the moon. It's really something. Could you describe and name your mount? Savage. Let's see here. Well, as soon as I step out of the, you know, out of the building and into the open, I'll whistle for Vicky. <whistles> Vicky! Okay. She and ties my... herself from the post and comes over. Oh, no, she's, she's not tied. She's wicked smart for a horse. Oh, okay. Um, using the human, uh, is it imperious? I believe uh, allows me to put two extra points into an ability score of my choosing for my animal companion. Okay. So I've chosen intelligence. So she's got a four inch. Oh, sweet. So she like tied herself up to make the other horses like feel normal. And then I tied herself to show off at the end. Yeah. With she's more intelligence. Can she speak? She's, she understands common. She understands it. Doesn't mean she can vocabulate it. No, she can't talk. Her accent is horrible, though. Just oh, there's of, a spell think for of the that. Movie, think of there the movie is a... Heldago, right? Where he's like, all right, let's go. You know, like, any time, buddy. And then the horse, like, right over. And, you know, yeah. he, talks to the ex- he, yeah, he talks to the horse. And the horse just, like, seems to understand. He can paw count complex equations. Does does algebra. Yeah, that's what it Does your taxes in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as, as Vicky kind of prances up, you know, I'll give her a quick brush. All right, girl. Looks like we're headed out. Are you done here? The horse looks around, gives me a quick nod. <laughs> Let, let's go. We can't right. hang around here all day. All right. And mounts up. And uh, Vicky's, like I was saying, is just a uh, the average, you know, as far as horses go. Um, let's see. I, I looked up some kind of base stats for horses. Uh, pretty burly, 16 strength, 4 ant, you know, that kind of thing. But, yeah, I mean, you know, 1,000-pound horse. About 15 hands tall. All right. Coloring? Uh, white with a gray mane. Okay. And one pale blue eye. The other one's brown. Because <laughs> that's not creepy. 
That's right. <laughs> that horse is looking at me. No? I've okay. seen such an animal, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> Never seen such a... All right. So, calling up the map here, gentlemen. Okay, we have an unmarked map of the capital city in Taldor of Opara. And the giant red square, just for my own... <laughs> just so I don't have to constantly ping it, is the actual church where you were headed. Okay? You guys are, shall we say, um, across town. You know, general facility, parlor with a minor noble, bid you farewell, you know, that type of thing. And you guys are headed across town in grand procession following Alcasti's carriage. So, not wanting to be left behind, Leon, mounting your what? Mounting my Taldor Jennet. A, a sh slightly shorter uh, horse, generally very uh, slight, uh, slight of frame, but nevertheless packed of power. Um, uh, the actual coloration, it's kind of a dark chocolatey brown with a kind of a red or kind of a pink scar going up over the eye and up behind the ear and down. Um, doesn't really know, it doesn't really show, ob it's not obvious like what caused that scar, but nevertheless, it's a very prominent feature of the face. He walks over, uh, Mukage, time to go. And the horse, similarly having actually not been tied up, just kind of turns around and gets and in, gets into position for a mount and <laughs> off I go. Does nobody tie up their horses anymore in this town? Okay, fine. <laughs> Well-trained horses don't need it. I know. I just... Surprise your horse doesn't get stolen, right? <laughs> They're stealing my horse. Well, he's small and he looks like he's burnt in the face. It's fine. I'm sure it would reject any rider that's not as special and has taken such good care of it as you, scars and all. All right. <laughs> so he is a boy horse. Anything else? He is. About our mount? Um, as I was saying, he seems especially thin compared to like any other, most of the other horses around the area, but okay. not quite, not quite like pony level or. Is this like the Arabian that... horse in in Thirteenth um, Warrior that Banderas rode compared to like the giant horses? It's he's just you know built for speed, that kind of. Yeah, thing? something like that. Okay. Uh, Tapo, you are enjoying the inside of a lavish carriage, but you can tell it's a rental. So it's like oh. one of those airport limos. It's nice. It's kept clean, but it's definitely used and probably not this man's personal belonging. He has probably shelled out some pretty coin to impress today. You know. Hmm. Well, it would have been impressive had it been his. Yes. <sighs> Whatever. Okay. We'll we'll do fine. I'll just look out the window and if it's a if I see someone I recognize, I'll I'll close it. <laughs> so I don't want anyone to know I'm in involved. How long the airport? Okay. I'll, I'll be the anonymous one. All right. That's fine with me. Next, we have Winston the Portly in his famous mount. So, walking out of the uh, entrance of the noble's house, curled up beside the the steps leading in, there's a um, medium-sized wolf just curled up in a little, you know, what what wild animal. Puppy ball. No, is he's wearing a saddle. It's okay. quite tame, ignoring all the passersby completely. But it appears that way. But he's keeping a wary eye out. Okay. Um, and he, you know, he steps down the stairs and Barkley gives pretends a little, to be a husky. <laughs> gives a little whistle and and up jumps Barkley, my uh, wolf <laughs> mount. Your wolf mount. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's not bark, bark, bark. It's woof, woof, grr. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and sl slipping a foot into the stirrup he kind of struggles to get himself up and onto the back of the saddle and just kind of looks over at sir bartholomew and says, <clears throat> excuse me sir uh, could i possibly trouble you for, for some assistance what uh, do you need aid with <laughs> he's struggling getting on his own bloody horse as it were and, and he just and walks the wolf up ain't puts, having it he's not his bowing hands down up like a baby <laughs> looking for a hug <laughs> <laughs> Barkley, Barkley is not leaning in on this at all. He stands a stiff. If anything, the wolf looks like he's on his tippy toes just to be a prick. Of course, companion. You can count on me. I pick him up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he gives a grunt as he lifts the bulk. Yeah, really. It's only a hundred pounds. Come on. That's you're, heavy. What's the armor? It's one hundred. Oh yeah. So like a hundred and probably. 60 like pounds 35 for the armor plus all your gear you know all your letters to a 15 year old boy 
<laughs> so you're saying Bartholomew's had experience with 15 year old boys? Oh, <laughs> no, not oh. crossing that line. I'm sorry, <laughs> I said it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't don't feed me stuff. Okay? <laughs> just don't 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 put ideas in the GM's head because you know it just comes out in a horrible fashion. I mean, we all know you regret nothing. You regret nothing. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm just warning. Fair warning. Regret Moral nothing, compass fair is just spinning north south north south there north you, south. There you go. <laughs> All right. So plopping him on his little wolf, or sorry, his mighty wolf, his famous wolf. Yeah, the wolf's more famous than I am. Oh yeah, no, it's well going through town. If the wolf sees anybody he knows, you know, he's giving them winks and nods, and you know, definitely draws attention in town. <laughs> yep. Kind of kicks up the back so your cape like flips over your head, kind of like Tapo drawing the curtain because he doesn't want to be seen with you. What coloring is the wolf? Grays and whites. Yeah, good standard wolf coloring. Okay. I was going to go for an Arctic wolf, but... Um, <laughs> nice big white target on the there's, field. There's Hopefully really he's... no <laughs> legit story way for me to have one of those. <laughs> and then you. I opened the crate that fell from the sky, and inside was an Arctic wolf. Yeah, oh, thank that you. I raised. I, it's I, my I own. Do, I do appreciate that. Uh, I'm assuming Barkley oh, came from the big, huge, inside Taldorian border, Verdon Forest. Yes. So we'll get to that. Sir Bartholomew, sending your companion on his way. Your mount is a uh, small uh, butternut draft horse. Okay. <laughs> like I like an actual workhorse that you've to combat trained. Yes. <laughs> Used to pull the beer and now he's uh, works for you. I took him away from all that. Now he works for me. Oh, oh no, Graf. Awesome. All right. So an interesting party of Cavaliers on an even more interesting and personable character, quite some characters of mounts. Now, let's see if we've got this straight. Guys, can you just for my own and for the viewing audience, and we'll just have to talk about it a lot for the podcast, in your Roll20 account, I see you have your name. Let's start with Samish, right? Okay. And under it, he has Frank. Okay. In curly brackets, could you put the name of your mount, please? For instant reference. Yep, yep. Thank you. Let's see here. So, while they're doing that, the ride, <laughs> gentlemen, is somewhat uneventful. However, as we pull around the proverbial corner... It's a random encounter. Nope. I've heard about these. This um, breathtaking view out to your left side of the hillock, which the church is mounted on, to the right is the city side. You guys have had to take a south turn. And now you're heading in a northerly direction. You're still like quite a few hundred meters from the coast and the cliff drop off into the actual inner sea and a magnificent view of the church on top of a hill. You guys come around the bend. You see this blue domed and fluted spires of the Basilia of the Last Man rise from the skyline of Opera, the capital of Taldor that you all proudly call home or at least your favorite place to visit. The Belissa rests atop a tall hill whose rolling grass-covered slopes are free of the usual bustle of city life, much like a park that, you know, people just don't really want to disturb and maybe have a little luncheon and then sneak away. A carriage approaches. The symbol of a Pegasus on its doorstop and it resting at the foot of the hill. Out of it, Tapo and Romeo Alcasti thank the driver and send him on his way. It is noted by all that the driver reminds Alcasti to take his pennant, the symbol of the Pegasus, which is more draped like a banner over the side of the window. So if you had any qualms about if this was sort of a rental for the day, it is assured now that, you know, his gold pieces have run out and he sort of tucks <laughs> that up and rolls it away while the rest of you slowly ride up and sort of catch up to the carriage. With a bow, thank you all for coming. We're here to check on the bust I mentioned earlier and in my note. And if we can convince Brother Velikus 
to let us move it to a safer location. The gods know I've tried, but he just won't listen to reason. Frank, I need you to feed me my own voice again, because I, I actually decided that, you know, whoever read the letter, that's the voice I would go with. And I've already lost it. Oh, you're you're super screwed. I forgot how I read it. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, okay. Any questions, gentlemen, as, you know, as Alcasti turns on his heel and marches up to the church itself? Any last minute preparation? Any questions for the GM? Uh, where would we find the stables? Uh, this church stands alone on a hill. Your smart horses will have to remain untied and well-behaved on their own somewhere. Do I have to get off my horse or my wolf? Uh, a wolf inside a church? Knowledge local? That's an ill omen. <laughs> uh, Lord uh, Gildervarth doesn't seem very impressed that you haven't dismounted and like keeping stride with them as we head up the hill. It seems like a bad idea to me. Yeah. Never heard of it happening before. <laughs> with that mighty nine in knowledge local. Maybe if you win a couple more barrel races, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe brother, um, or sorry, father, um, Voskis is a betting man and, you know, you could, uh, you know, bet on the dogs, maybe set up, yeah, right. you know, put him into a gambling race. I, I don't know. Start up a new religion based on the wolf. <laughs> he climbs onto the top of the tower. Anyway, uh, you're pretty sure that society dictates this is a bad idea. Mounts are well-respected, but they go where they go. Four-legged okay. four friends, not so much. Now, if you're some powerful archmage that had some little parrot on your shoulder, I'm sure they might overlook, but, you know. Four paws on the church floor, probably frowned upon. But that's not stopping you. I'm not stopping you. I'm just saying. Yeah, I won't. I'll dismount with everybody else. Okay. And he immediately falls behind. Not just because of his halfling movement. <laughs> no, totally because of my halfling movement. <laughs> like 20 feet plus the... Not to mention it takes me twice as long to get off uh, my mount. No, that's okay. Actually, uh, Barkley will like get behind you with his head down and push you along. You know, just so he can keep pace. I'll stop at the door. Then, he, then he'll round up all the sheep. I mean, horses and make them parallel park on that sort of strange left-handed 45 degree angle with their noses along the wall of the church. Yeah. Yeah. Barkley takes me up to the edge of the step so I can literally just step off. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> He'll just carry you right up there and then just sort of stop at the step so you just kind of walk off the front level with the ground. Anyone else? I'll dismount off of Vicky and kind of grab her by the, the chin and give her a quick scratch. All right, keep an eye out. All right. And then move on. And, and Vicky, because she doesn't have like any kind of guard or any kind of tricks like that just kind of starts gnawing at grass and slowly wanders off, but doesn't go too far. Okay. Yeah. There's lots of, uh, <laughs> lots to keep them busy out here. I mean, there's each other, some are boy horses, some are girl horses. There's, you know, there's no bustle of the city. It's all open air, breeze, grass, you know, that's a really good spot for them to hang out. I don't think they're fuss at all. Which, right on. which gets us back to the actual play podcast. Church. <laughs> the actual church. Anyone have knowledge religion? Oh. Not often I call for these rolls out loud, yeah. but you know what? Why not? No, sir, I do not. No, no. sir, do not. All right. Can we make them untrained? <laughs> well, yes. I can tell you what a DC 10 or lower, which is common knowledge for any untrained. I will take a 10. All right. So one by one, you guys kind of sort of come up the steps and take in the grandeur, which is the church, remembering facts about the god Aroden, the human that ascended, the great champion, and then, finally, I've heard of him. then finally died, and now his church and faith are sort of in decline. But he was a big part oh. of Taladian history, so the church remains. Entering inside. Mm. Wondering why you're hesitating. Alcasti actually comes back out and, you know, Waves you in. It's okay. Come, come with me, gentlemen. After my lordships, as I move, hold my hand out, <laughs> wait, stand by the door waiting for everyone to usher in. Thank you, Tapo. Thank you. I'll, uh, <laughs> Good I'll, 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 I'll move on in. The, uh, the craftsmanship at the Church of Herodin is quite spectacular. I apologize for tarrying too long, but 
It's not often I make it to this side of town. Yes. Come on, Captain. Turning uh, turning to uh, Bartholomew. Come on, Captain. We don't always get... People like us don't get in here very often. No, I was just taking in the grandeur. That's a lot of stone. Yeah. What do you think you could do with that? It's I bet you you could really build at least far. like five houses with that. Oh, no doubt. Or one hmm. really big wall. This looks very fortifiable. Looks like I could defend this well. Yeah, actually, this this is some solid stonework, as far as you can tell. Now, it's not exactly the, All right, the city is... exactly meant for like you know the man to stand upon. It certainly is quite the death zone surrounding the surrounding the chapel. Yep. Hinting at yes. your, like nodding at your bow. <laughs> yes. The archers are just like, yeah, we just set up camp here. and I'm already marking my targets. <laughs> <laughs> There's nobody here but you guys. Archers like are, I said. <laughs> just creepily looking at you guys. That's, All right. That's that's really creepy. All right. Um, well, soldiers are, they have that air of menace around them. Yes. You always got to be ready for combat. No, yeah. that's fine. And as you are sort of making observations and getting to know one another, I am taking liberal use of the macros I've made in roll 20 and spamming some whisper rolls to myself. Now, the first thing you guys go in, you're overwhelmed, vaulted ceilings, you know, but everyone does notice the sort of, you know, uh, scent of dust. I mean, it's cleaned, but you, you know, and there's some of the side little pews and offshoot rooms and the faded of the crimson drapes, you know, like this is, this church isn't getting a lot of money and a lot of, you know, passing the hat of late. It's, uh, it's not fallen into ruin and it does not look in disrepair. Far from it. There's enough generation, generations of, of um, generosity still believing in this church and the building itself to keep its maintenance up. But there's certainly no lackluster or grandeur or, you know, that sort of thing going on here. Tapo and Sir Winston you two yes. actually notice that there are paintings and tools missing off of prominent places in the wall. There should be, you know, painting, painting, gap, painting, painting. Hey, wait a minute. Shouldn't there be a painting there? You can kind of just make out the fade on the, the stone discoloration. Um, there's a couple of, um, shall we say, holy acraments and tools that are on prominent dis display and some of the lower ones, like there's a couple of missing rungs and racks that seem to be empty. This catches your notice as you guys. I mutter something about, hmm, it looks like uh, they've been selling things to make up the lack of, uh, of um, what, what's the term? Uh, tithes, that's the term, yes. Making the Lack payments. of tithes. <laughs> Making the mortgage payments. No. Yes. Uh, again, sort of drifting Our off time. ahead of you guys as you guys sort of um, tour guide your way in here with Samish at the lead. Romeo disappears into the back end of the church and reappears, dragging a man in simple robes. And he introduces him as Father Velikus. A great amount of trepidation, gentlemen, you all notice is on his face. Romeo doesn't seem to notice it. It's like, oh, I got him, you know convincing him dragging him out to you guys saying hey this is the guy i want you to my, meet my friends you know and you guys noticed um father Velikus sort of um pressing his thumbs against his forefinger and looking around nervously even so much as whipping out a little hanky and dabbing his brow before he gets within that 30 feet that you'd notice to present himself to you i say father Velikus, is everything all right you seem a bit distraught Actually, um, now, now, Romeo cuts in, um, no stalling. I have come to petition you once more for the rightful property of my ancestor. You know I'm the rightful heir, and soon enough, with these great gentlemen's help, I shall prove it once and for all. Please, can you not do your part and acquiesce those items to me? And as, as if that's your cue, he steps aside and sort of with a sweeping motion, you know, like, you're on, guys. <laughs> Make the argument in my case. Big grin, you know, doing the yes nod, hoping you guys are going to jump in there. It's it's downright shameful. <laughs> it's just sort of like paying you guys to, you know. So Sa Samish will kind of shrug and step forward. 
all right. If 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 I'm here to to sell us a, a point of view, I guess so be it. Um, Father Vickers, can you can you tell me about this bust that we are to to look at? It, it seems that perhaps this is not the best place for it. Giving and he'll look around, noting the missing portraits that were pointed out to him. Given the uh, current level of patronage. Um, well, I, um, you know, the priest sort of stammers and, and rubs the back of his neck and looks around nervously and, uh, as if misunderstanding and taking that your cue isn't enough. Um, can I have a diplomacy check from you, sir? And does anyone else wish to jump in and aid with, which, you know, really should be a very simple. I'm here for when diplomacy fails. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, up to I'll, two, up to two I'll throw down on, yeah. I'll throw down on that. Uh, uh-huh. eight, so. All right. So both Leon and Bartholomew step forward. And our current patron can clearly afford proper protection. Rolling. Don't forget to call it your rolls, guys. This is a podcast. Roll them as soon as you pop up, because I'm actually not showing the roll bar in this. They can see your raw dice. But... Diplomacy 16. Okay. Ooh. I got a 13. Uh, 14, 15 with the aid. Okay. Uh, each guy will give you an additional plus two when they pop 10. What'd you get there, Ryan? So uh, 17. One gave his line. The other guy gave the dice roll. I need you guys to go back and yeah, Leon's no, line. Look, and... Looking for the actual dice roller and the character sheet. Oh, okay. Well, that was a good line, you know. And, you can and said, just select the yeah. You can figure it out. Oh, you just click it. Did I just roll? click the link? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I got a thirteen. Okay. All right. So I believe that gives me a total of plus uh, seventeen. Yes. Yes, it does. So I mean, I, the in the corner. I mean, after all, it would be most unfortunate, to say, if. Uh, certain items would come up missing that may reflect quite negatively on the Church of Arrowden. Are you sure you wish to hold on to something like this? You know, trying to okay. leverage their um, financial insecurities. He, Father finally cracks under the sort of um, row of men all just kind of nudging him and says, well, actually, it, it's gone missing. And he just, <laughs> just stands there wringing his hands. Gone missing. This admission infuriates Romero, and he immediately gets in the father's face, and he's like, what? And begins shouting. I stand and voices. pull my sword. Okay. Ready for action. <laughs> okay. Now, Sir, Sir Romero, I'm sure we can figure out where it went. I mean, just because it's missing doesn't mean it was, like, sold off. So you're trying to calm it down? Yeah. Do you wish also me kind to of run this man the... through? <laughs> <laughs> Killing a priest in his place of worship is very poor taste. I mean, I Leon, can I would... have a diplomacy check at negative two because Tapo is certainly not helping? <laughs> I'm trying to intimidate. <laughs> oh, okay. You're doing your own thing. Intimidate doing... to do what? To have him cow before me. Okay. <laughs> he, he's already... Kneel before Zod. All right. No, I'm actually, what I'm trying to do is uh, back up Romario. I'm yeah, yeah, no, no, I got it. Like, Romario's furious, and Tapo is jumping in there going, you know, so that's fine. Yeah. Completely different sort of agenda going here, but sure, let's have yes. it intimidate away. Uh, but okay. get it, starting Watch off with that. Leon here. Yeah, Leon first. Uh, diplomacy of 11. Okay. <laughs> Tapo's intimidating. 23. <laughs> okay. My sword gleams, the edge sharp. It somehow has found itself within an inch of its eye, his eye. All right. Um, Cough up. Fa- father, who, might, father, who might be in trouble here? Uh, <laughs> father Felicus pales at Ta- Tapo's you know, obvious implications of what will happen to him if he can't magically produce this thing that's gone missing and takes a step back, waving his hands up and says, I, I'm so sorry, Romero. Uh, 
I mean, Lord, Cassidy, I, I should have listened to you. It's just, you know, there was no need. It's been here for so long. And I have, besides yourself, there has been no interest in it. And you're the only one that actually connected it to any uh, form of nobility, even of your own name. I'm, I'm so terribly sorry. Anyway, and he seems, you know, sufficiently cowed. Now, while this is going on, Leon does manage to plant a firm hand on Romero's shoulder and pull him back a step as well and calm the man down. But now... Tapo has taken up, <laughs> you know, so we have, um, and uh, seeing, just, seeing Tapo yeah. draw his sword. So Winston <laughs> walks up beside him, reaches up and puts his hand on his gauntlet and says, show some respect. Good man. We're in a place of worship here. I am showing the proper respect. He did not honor Romario's request of guarding it properly. He should pay where, where, could have this gone who could have taken it okay romario takes a dramatic deep breath and then ex he explains well let's at least hear the man out. all right fine shink all right Valicious, <sighs> with a great big sigh of relief explains that he only left the relics unattended for a few minutes um and several metallic relics including the bus were gone when i get back and he sort of like waves off to the side as if showing you the side of the room where this stuff was displayed or kept. What do you guys want to do? It was kept there in that room? Yeah, in the little side room. Can we go look? Yep, he's he's sort of gesturing as if you guys, you know. Sir Winston goes and looks at the places that are emptied and spends like a, like takes his time and really examines them to look for signs of like stuff being reefed away or any. All right. Now, I know what you're saying. Sorry, I know what you're thinking. We were hired by a noble, Hal Three Musketeer. We travel to a church. Awesome. We're on the way to the political reign. You know, the church always has great big pull in the political arena of a medieval world. And now, suddenly, we've been shafted into a Scooby-Doo mystery. But hey, what can you do? So, gentlemen, going around the room, starting left to right, just we'll go on the order of um, the roll 20 here, Samish being the lead on this one. The well, gentleman, as some, some guys take interest in the room and head off. Some are still talking to, to uh, Father Vickis. You know. Well, as the others kind of go and explore the room, I'm going to stop and talk with uh, Father Vickis. Kind of do two things at once. Kind of Sorry, Vickis. Uh, <laughs> We're just Villicus. butchering this. We are just murdering this guy's poor name. Yeah. Um, kind of laying his fears at ease, but then trying to get a little more information from him. Okay. Um, well, since the, since the effects of Tapo's in intimidation are still in play, this is difficult in its current setting. You might want to get him away from the angry noble and his new guard dog. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and that's well, what I mean. As the others he'll answered, he'll answer anything you want. You ask, just ask him. I'll make sure. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Tapo <laughs> asks him, he'll cough up anything you want to know. I grab his, the, the, the scruff of his shirt, pull him a little closer. Answer his questions. Yes, yes, of course. And I'll set my hand on Tapos. Now, now, I, I believe your skills would be most useful over there, investigating where the crime took place. Let me talk to the kind priest here, and we'll get to the bottom of this eventually. Hmm. Now, now, Father? I let him go. Come with me, okay. please. Romero okay. was actually enjoying his anger as being played out by one of his new subordinates. So Romero doesn't do anything to affect the situation. He's just happily nodding at Tapo like, yeah, yeah, that's right. The man and, should uh, suffer. The man's done us wrong, you know. That's right. That's right. You know, kind of a saying this guy's fears. Um, so please, talk to me. Who else knows that the bust was here or that it was of any value? I mean... Obviously, this is a place of worship and people go in and out, but how many actually pay attention to the objects to what? Um, sort of, again, taking the sidestep, really trying hard not to let Romero hear. He leans into you and he says, actually, um, the only thing I can uh, think of, good sir, is the fact that we do have the odd worshiper and some attendants around, you know, all have been checked out and have worked for the church, volunteers, and, you know, minor clergy. Um, they all have vows of poverty. You know, he, he goes through the list and assures you that, you know, mm -hmm. staff is not a problem. Um, but then he says, um, 
Romeo, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Casti has visited me often and frequently of late and has made a big show and has been quite loud. And if there was anyone visiting the church that, you know, um, may think that since our Lord's in decline and not worth, do you understand what I'm saying? Kind of, I, under- kind I understand. Of implies, you know, like that, you know, the herd might be tempted going, you know, I'm still paying lip service to this dead God and, uh, <laughs> valuable bust you say hmm that kind of thing anyway that's the father's father Villicus's best theory at this time okay so nobody in his opinion seems like like a first timer you know and everybody that comes to pay worship is a familiar face they come regularly and things like that nobody knew yes okay can I use my survival skills to look for any tracks or any signs left behind by whoever might have taken them? Yes, you may, sir. You head into the room where he had pointed out they were kept. Survival away. Survival of 12? Survival of 12. You do find that there's been some extra traffic, but you can't really identify if it's staff or, you know, like the proverbial thief or whatever. It's one of those things is like, am I looking at tracks or am I just really looking at wear and tear? With a 12, you're just not sure. Okay. Now, gentlemen, you are a party of Cavaliers and your skill set is pretty bare bones. So if anyone has a duplicate skill from this point on and wants to jump in, you know, aid another, aid another to boost your skills like you guys did last time, by all means, but I'm this is the last time I'm going to ask. Yep. And... Uh, um I'm, get... I'm quite well suited for aiding another. Um, I give a plus four bonus rather than a plus two bonus based on my uh, halfling talent helpful. Yes. Okay. Now, I've always considered halflings to be quite helpful. Part get of... me a beer. <laughs> part of the talent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing because I actually, I, I know Frank's got a craft beer in his hand. I just know it. <laughs> what, are you, what are you drinking, Frank? I, I do indeed. Oh. I am currently drinking Ace Pineapple Craft Cider. Oh, very nice. Let's try that. <laughs> a product of California. Do they make Insert that on the side product of the placement here? Yeah. Thank you, California. Well, half our crew is Canadian, the other half is American. So I'm just curious can we get that good old, that good, sweet ambrosia up here or no? Uh, I can ship one to you as far as the border. I don't know what it looks like going across borders. Have a yeah. long way to go for so, a drink. So I'll meet you, I'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. All right. So just chuck it across Niagara Falls to us. <laughs> I'm open. Yeah, this is where we regret having the nice side of the falls with the big basin where you're just you know on the catching side of a beer that's coming across. It's uh we'll never make that reach. <laughs> Some guy in the little rainbow warrior down there on the bottom gets conked on the head, one less yellow jumpsuit wearing coat gets just falls over the side, but you know vic- a victim of Frank's throw. So but we digress. Yes. There's, there's something here. You just can't seem to make heads or tails of it. So I'm um, gonna say, can we aid another for survival checks, or do we have to be trained? That is a good question. Hey, you uh, have to be trained in survival to make a survival check. And if I, you if you have the time to really pay attention, meaning take a twenty, yeah. about how long? I mean, do we have that much time? Oh yeah, it, take, it takes, takes an minutes. hour. Two minutes. Uh, for survival check. Oh, does it? I, okay. Yeah. Are you talking I, about like foraging? Um, well, that's like if we go out into the wilderness and I want to like figure out the best route to get somebody somewhere and take my time to do so to make sure it's safe or whatever, it takes me an hour. And and if the terrain's not familiar, it's two hours. Well, I can tell you this. You guys, any non-trained can burn a move action to make a perception check to find tracks, but you can't follow them. And you can't really make heads or hair of what they are. The survivalist can say, oh, it's this type of creature, I believe, or this kind of footprint, and he can follow them outside the area. But anyone untrained can make perception checks and go, that's a track. You know, that's a big dinosaur foot, you know, that kind of thing. But can't make heads or tails that's of, a- like, the creature or, you know, where it's going or follow the trail. You know, they instantly lose it. That much I can give you out of the book. So, perceptions all around, gentlemen? Oh, I was going to say, oh, I could aid sure. survival. Oh, you can? Do you actually have it? Yeah. A dra- uh, it's a Order of the Dragon. All right. Well, uh, aid me, sir. Aid me. What is it you're trying to do there? All right. Well, since, track. Let me show you how to since track. Since we're out of the gate, I will let you retcon this. But I'm telling you, my generosity is going to dry up really quick, guys. 
no 18, worries. 18, boosting him to 14. But still. Could he aid me instead? Bartholomew. <laughs> oh, no, I declared first. Bartholomew, uh, yeah, leave the room for an hour, come back, and after they've swept up the room and make, look for fresh tracks. Uh, you guys are all standing around making new tracks. That's the best part. We all enter the room, and we're all bustling around, and we all, oh, we find tracks. Really, sir? Yes. A, a tiny halfling has tread through. Start walking in a circle. I know. Yeah. This is what I'm picturing. You guys are in this little room going, we'll look for tracks, you know. We haven't done that CSI part of the Cavalier training where you guys get to a doorway and go, no one touch anything, you know, and one guy steps in. You guys, like, oh, three guys went in here all looking around, and then one guy goes, hey, while I'm in here, do I see? Why, yes, you do. Three sets of tracks, actually. Isn't so that's... if that's the case, and actually, like, try to perceive if um, where the bust used to be and see if there's, like, a piece of ripped-off cloth on the mantle or... Uh... Oh, any other evidence of theft or disable or yes sure i look for clues look for clues this really is getting scooby-doo isn't it All we didn't right. split up yet 17 uh this is an excellent excellent train of thought that can aid you elsewhere and in other parts of the venture gentlemen i will tell you this but right here at this point in time you're coming up not nah. but i do like uh, your thinking and don't give up in the future and, I'll, and after taking a look at where it was and not really gleaming anything of use, I'll go over to the priest and kind of take him aside and... Um, good sir, is there anyone who would, who would wish ill will upon this fair establishment? Uh, looking sideways at Romero. <laughs> not Well, there's enemies of the church, of course, but I, uh, I don't think so. I believe specifically we're thinking of the family. Anyone come to mind that um, that would be capable of such a brazen act? No, no, no. Like, like I said, there's like, there's just the just the staff maintain these rooms, and it's the the staff that, in my opinion, you know, check out and. Well, let's let's verify that. Bring him in here. Who was the first person to notice this, the bust was missing? Um, well, um, brother Davros. Actually, that dweeb from Sandpoint, the very same. So Isn't he, he on the run. He he goes <laughs> and uh, they call know, it the Lamb. He he goes and gets the closest loitering staff member and asks him to fetch Brother Davros. And a sh Davros. very short time later, <laughs> a young half elf appears with sandy blonde hair and is adorned in. Uh, sort of acolyte, like, you know, brand new convert to the faith kind of thing. He's wearing the penance robes. Maybe he's either giving up a former faith. I don't know, maybe Saren Ray or something. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's looking to convert to a dead god, you know. And, uh, yeah, <clears throat> Hi. still has the sand on his pointed shoes. So, um, muttering to himself, coming out, Father Vilkis, you know, these men, explains the situation. We form the circle of interrogation. Yes. How about a circle of diplomacy, intimidation, bluff, and all the usual social skills? <laughs> How do you guys want to go with this? <laughs> what? I'll wait until diplomacy fails. Okay. So what are we leading? What skill are we leading here with, gentlemen? Diplomacy. Okay. Diplomacy. Right. Who's our lead? Um, One lead, two aid. That's I'll the last take time you guys are professional lead. players. You've been playing for I'll, years. You're doing I'll this aid. stuff. I'll aid. <clears throat> All right. How I have a you? plus six, uh, so but I'll aid. Okay. Because it's a good aid for me. All right. Lead roller, player, please. I roll. I got a fourteen. All right. Woohoo! Let's have the spiel there. How do you uh, how do you approach this gentleman? You guys are a half circle of all differing differing views. We have the angry side, Alcasti and Tapo, to the sympathetic side, Samish, and the matter of fact side of you guys playing capo in the middle here so we're playing good night bad night you guys That's are right. sort of a uh, black white yeah. and gray mix it's kind of confusing to approach you guys at once um brother davros we heard that you were the last one to actually see this uh object that's gone missing i was hoping you might be able to uh tell us what you saw or didn't see when you he, he didn't. asked you what everybody rolled you got 14 
Uh, Winston fails with an eight because you need ten I, for the aid. Anybody yep, else aiding? Boo. I succeeded with a twenty-one. So diplomacy. that brings us up to sixteen. I also succeeded on a diplomacy uh, to aid. Yes, that would bring him up to sixteen. Okay. Um. I, um, uh, I was polishing the pews, and um, when I finished. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, I went to clean the rooms in the side, and I then it was then I noticed that it was empty, gone. Yeah. And looking sense at Father motive? Vilkis to like be let go, you know? Can I go now? <laughs> you can sense motive untrained, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, honestly, guys, you can call for it, or if it's you know if if an NPC starts bluffing and I'm doing those roles, I'm automatically doing sense motive okay. for you guys. Okay. Oh, but, okay. And, but instead of like going hmm, sometimes I might go hmm, you know, <sighs> hey there, Tapo, he seems to be lying. Sometimes if Got it's it. kind of obvious to everyone in character, I'll just have them act really, really hesitant and shifty right as well, opposed that's to that's cool like a, you know that's what i exactly thought you were doing yeah okay so basically so, if, it, if it's like oh, one okay. or two guys make the roll i'll point it out to those two guys but if like everyone's kind of on to the sense motive i'll just role play the guy as a schmuck okay, <laughs> okay. oh that's so we're all getting the sense then that he's something uh, not le- right. yeah leaving stuff out being evasive i no, hoist okay. him up off his feet <laughs> you're gonna tell me exactly what it is you know okay he gets wide-eyed, doesn't wiggle, and then annoyedly looks to his left shoulder and says, no, no, it, it, it's fine, dear. I, I, I got this. And he looks back at you and he says, okay, okay, there's, there's no need for hostilities. The hostilities haven't even begun yet, friend. <laughs> he calls, he mumbles a name at you you do not recognize. Maybe he knows another half-orc. Just put me if down. Only, if only a little bit here. <laughs> Just put me down. And so I'd like intimidate of seventeen. Okay, is anyone backing him up on this? Oh yes, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. I'll always, I'll always attempt. Yeah, I, I suggest that if anyone oh. has an idea to use any um, skill, that two guys just lean in and go, and we help. You know, this yep. free plus four. You know, I'm successful. Aha. A dagger has appeared in my hand and pointing. To press I'm, against I'm, aid, I'm aiding as well. Okay. I pull he, my arms across my chest and look all intimidating. Puffs all stand up, stand on his toes. Stand on his toes. So as so as one person like a blowfish. <laughs> as one person stands on his toes and another's trying to hoist him up and a third's trying to press a knife to his neck. Back. Back. Please. I, please. I've, I've brother, encountered brother Defos. i he puts his hands up and just takes a step back, shaking. I've encountered the demons Ouch. of Sandpoint and the goblin raids, but he says, but nothing as crazy as this. Father Vilkas, he just kind of looks at him. Anyway, this anyway, Father Vilkas comes over and puts a hand on him. Like they're there, like this guy is some kind of victim. You know what I mean? Like he, we don't we don't pull him out much. You know, the guy's been through a lot, seen terrible things, and maybe had some kind of breakdown. And you know, took all his courage to like puff up and come out here. And then you guys just start shaking him around to it ate him. So he just starts losing it. You know, just kind of uh, turtles up as it were. Anyway, Vilkas jumps in, kind of assures him, no, it's okay. You know, you, you know. Just tell the men what they want to know, and then they'll leave. And we can go back to, you know, cleaning, you know, the, the chores. Polishing the mahogany. That's right. Go back to the chore, the rhythmic cleaning, remember? And he's making this wax on, wax off, and and the half-elf's head's bobbing in unison to the, the motion going, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, actually. <laughs> cleaning the scepters. Yeah. Cleaning yes. the scepters. It's, it's, it's soothing. Yes. He's an altar boy. <laughs> A lot of kneeling. If you'd praying. like to see more of my uh, oh. unstable halfling cleric, <laughs> listen to Clinton Score Classics playing Rise of the Rune Lords Anniversary Edition. Okay, we're done with that cameo. Okay. So, mm-hmm. former. Former. Sorry, I had to leave the show. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Amongst the distraction of noises and gentlemen all talking over each other and everything, he finally, Father Vilkas finally kinds of straighten this poor man up and assures him it's okay you know this is a safe place you can tell the gentleman what you saw so he guiltily admits to vilkas sort of like tells vilkas his friend is in front of you guys as opposed to like looking at you guys making eye contact i um was supposed to be polishing the ballista's pews but i decided to lie down for a nap and 
I was just falling asleep when I saw a hunched over and he kind of searches for the word and then looks at Sir Portly and says, a halfling sized humanoid running through the halls. This sized? Sized like this? And I point to uh, Sir, Sir Portly. Yes, yes. Not much bigger than him. You mean as big as him? Yes. Well, hunched down. Really? He's the one? No. Oh, look, with a look of surprise and shock on my on, on my face. <laughs> I, I, Are you saying this is the one? I, and I I'm don't, pointing. I don't know. <laughs> he becomes I, confused. I, I, think, <laughs> I think if it, if it was so portly, he would have had different adjectives to use to describe the thing he witnessed. Mm. I'm confused. He so, says it's so him, but it's not him. Elf that you keep <laughs> jumping on every time he gets almost tells you something useful. Um, anyway, gentlemen, well, of course, can I have perception all around? Not Tapo, who's jumping the gun. Everyone yes, but Tapo, give me a perception check. Tapo is all up in the busy in this Tapo, here. You, get, you get the glint of he doesn't put two and two together very well. It, Ooh, no, perception he's, he's, he's of a man 20. of action. I get it. Man of action <laughs> deals with what's in nine. his face, you know. <laughs> Um, That's right. You guys did notice that he did gesture Ooh. in a random direction that has nowhere near, you know, where you've been or when he was describing, you know, I saw him hunched and run through the halls and he distinctly did gesture off in a single direction before Once Tapo got up on him and just confused the hell out of him. Which, okay. That's that what hall. you guys get for your perception. Oh. <clears throat> he went that way. Hmm. Does he mean literally? I asked the rest of the group. I believe he's telling the truth. Well, which direction did he point? I wasn't paying attention. Yes, and bringing it up is practically meta. Gentlemen, what do you do? Um, set him down, dust him off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you put him down the last time. I've been saying this entire thing up in the air. Okay. Yes. Okay, no wonder I'm so rattled. All right. Well, so partly, shall we go for a walk? Splendid we... idea, good chap. Splendid idea. So you might as well have a gander that way. Oh, hey, there he is. Don't <laughs> mind if I join. I think don't... I'll watch this one. And I point at Brother Davros. Don't, don't be think... shy, Samus. You're the, the holiest of us all. Oh, no, I accidentally closed my uh, uh, roll 20 account. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blind. I'm blind. What? I'm flying blind. Samish has these fits of blindness. All right. Okay, so uh, so I'll I'll take uh, Brother Dabros, you, you, you know, and, and you haven't been taking the Taldor Pod challenge, have you? And you know, blindness. Yeah, blindness. Uh, quite uh, I, eyes closed, Brother Dabros in hand, and we begin to walk that way down the hall. Okay. Now you must be exhausted from pew polishing, but please humor me a moment, if you will. Have you seen a halfling like this before? He giggles and goes with you. Pew <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, he points in the direction, and you guys get to a wall, and there's a stairwell and a door at the bottom of a, a short flight of stairs. Father this Velikus sta uh, basically explains, oh, you know, kind of filling in, because the man is still, still kind of holding your hand abashedly, talking to someone that isn't there off of his left shoulder. So Vilkis kind of um, <clears throat> covers up for his acolyte and steps in with you guys and says, oh, this uh, le this leads to the catacombs, actually, beneath the church. And now, who would have knowledge of these catacombs? And, and who would have authorization or permissions to move freely from there to here? Uh, well, really only myself, as the caretaker, has the key. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. All right. Finally frustrated at the length of this uh, proceeding, Romero steps forward and demands the key from Valkus and says, The game is afoot. Oh, I rather like the sound of that. Can I? And he looks at you guys all shaking your heads. Oh, never mind. Let's get to the bottom mm. of this. And he demands the key from Valkus, who pats himself down and produces it. Hands it to Okalsti, who immediately hands it to Samish. <laughs> he says he'll go, but he's not going to lead. I'll take the key. Okay. Move it and move it uh, up towards the gate and unlock it. Okay. Turn back towards my companions. 
shall we? And, and uh, Sir Winston turns to um, turns to the what was the guy's name? The priest, Vivicus. Vilicus. Vilicus turns to him and says, um, "Excuse me, sir. There's there's one more thing I would like to try before we enter the the, the catacombs here. Um, my companion outside has a, a a quite unique ability when it comes to um to tracking things down. If you wouldn't mind, uh, I would like." permission to bring my mount into your church you wish to bring your horse here? Oh, oh no sir no sir barkley's no horse <laughs> horse <laughs> um romeo starts waving at the priest like nodding like you know it's okay gentlemanly company assures him that you know this is good this is fine so they agree so sir winston runs outside gives a whistle for Barkley to come to the stairs so he can climb on with as much ease as possible. Okay. And then he, you know, cautiously rides uh, Sir Barkley into the church, and I'm going to throw out a ride check for you there. All right. Gentlemen, forming, if I can. Up, forming up behind Samish at the door. Sir Samish, the key turns quite easily for Father Vilkas's claims of ill use and pity use and not often used. The door swings open with a low groan, revealing a very, very, very dark hall, which is a continuation of the same stairway down into a stone and musty depths. Marching order, gentlemen. Only five foot wide stairway and... You are effectively blind. There is no light down here. Uh, I can see. Except for the half-orc. Well, mm. I think the half-orc should go first, then. I walk in. Of course I should go first. I'm the bravest one here. Before Sir Winston goes towards the stairwell, he takes Barkley into the room where the bust was and has him sniff around to see if he can pick up any scents. Okay. Uh, the wolf has survival? Scent and survival, yes. Um, okay. And he gets a bonus. Can you roll right when, off of his sheet? Because you should I'm, actually, there I'm should be a dice just, icon. I'm just checking to see if I can. You should be able to. Um, now, if not, you can just tell me the bonus and, you know, controlling. So it's, it's a, um, normally it's a one, but because he's tracking by scent, he gets a plus four. So he's a plus five to his survival check. Okay. Now these mounts like Druid ability, uh, Cannibal Companions are specifically bonded to you guys. So just to bring this up, uh, one quick moment for our studio audience. What this entails is they are practically like there's a supernatural, practically magical bond between these gentlemen and their mount of choice they can sense each other it's, it's sort of empathic and it will grow and there'll be all kinds of powers added but it's not just a, a training thing where like good boy and we spent all this time and i raised you from a pup there's a a palatable connection between each cavalier and his mount so some mount. may call it an empathic link exactly i will allow you to roll the skills for your own mounts gentlemen so go right ahead I can't roll it off the page, so I'll just do a raw one using sure. the roller. 1d20 plus 5. Okay. So who's falling in behind? Well, he's off for having a sniff, and the half-orc's headed for the stairs. Oh, who's falling in behind? Nope. Anybody lighting up torches? Six. I, no? I call ahead, and I say, Halfling, be helpful. Light a torch. I need both hands to wield this bow. Okay. I'd like to follow in behind uh, Bartholomew, if that's okay. No problem. Like, and... Uh, Halfling has actually gone off to the other side of the church, so he's going to Tapple is delaying, uh, yes. which leaves I'll Samish I'll at the spark door. Up, yeah, I'll spark up a torch since I can't see in. Excellent. Okay. Someone has some sense. All right. Now, quickly, Orc, move in and explore for us. Who? <laughs> I believe he's talking to the captain here. You do know I have a name, right? Of course you do. Human. But that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Excuse me, that's Lord Gildevarth to you. <laughs> right, human. Okay. <laughs> you may call me your liege, your lordship, 
any of those will do, but human will get you, I don't know, the bowman there could take <laughs> care of it quite wacky. easily. <laughs> Joe, stern talking to. All right. The bowman can barely see. You're the only target he can see. All right. So just to get this straight, passing by Samish, the head of the pack, is our half-orc cavalier Bartholomew, followed by the quasi-Asian, orphan-raised samurai with a bow, uh, Hakiro, what's your name? <laughs> I want to say Setsuna, but you changed it at last minute. Akihiko. Hakiko, but we just call you Leon. Yeah, as just, just call me Leon. Okay. Then we have Lord Gildavarth, the mightiest of us, the truest of us all, followed by the ever skeptical Tapo, also with Bo. And bringing up the rear from dallying, we have Romeo and our mounted tracking, smelling, sniffing everything, Sir Portly. And I shall take us to the scene, as it were. Slowly, the world comes into focus. Slowly, the world comes into focus. Now, I have taken the liberty of doing a little bit of ambient lighting, uh, sort of um, Diablo style, where you get a sense of rooms and places around just from knowing how much building and flat space is above you and how big the rooms could be. But coming down the stairway, another 15, 20 ish feet, a sharp left. So now we are entering the map in its center from left to right facing east starting with bartholomew you come to a the first room shall we say can i have perception all around do keep in mind gentlemen that for every 10 foot distance you are from something making noise or visible if you even have line of sight there is a negative one penalty that stacks and i'll be applying them keeping eyes on where your minis stand so someone at the back rolling high could actually do crappier than someone at the front rolling low. If that makes sense to you. I hope it does. I believe it does. You believe <clears throat> it does? I believe, I believe. Roll 20 got super laggy when you opened this map. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing that, actually. So, so Samish pauses for a moment as soon as we kind of move down and kind of lifts his ear up and gets a 19. Okay. On the way down, the three things you notice is the dampness, the heavy, solid stone cut fixture that is around you, making up this place, and the imposing decorate, decorated winged eye of Arodin, which was on the back of the rotting door that we came through, and several other deteriorating doors, in a single wedge-shaped room so if you guys were literally to step out of this hallway into the room and sort of place hands flat on the walls beside you this wall is straight and then going east there is a door to your right and to your left and then coming to the back wall the, the back wall is actually angled in funneling to the rear wall which appears to have a double door at it barely visible from the torchlight of sir Gildmarsh. So, sorry, Gildemarsh, Gildervarth. Sorry, my lord. <clears throat> the um, staircase ends here in this room, and immediately on your right, exiting the room like a real tucked kitty corner, is another staircase. However, it does not go very far at all. It seems to be blocked as its ceiling has been completely collapsed in a rubble of stone. Does that head downward or upward? Downward. Ah, blocked downward. Okay. Are we free to move about? You are free to move about as I am taking note of your ride and perception checks and will reveal the scene as they pop up. And as I quickly scan... Walk into the room. Okay. Huh. Smells old. Now take note, tracker... Do you see any disturbance on the floor that might lead to a culprit? Be quick about it. So taking a, a torch out before I go down, I spark it up and um, and bring uh, 
myself and Barkley down the stairwell, and I, I rolled a ride check at 24. I think that should be okay. good enough to get him to... Yeah, you're, you're free to... Oh, yes. Well, thank you for the ride check for moving a wolf downstairs. There is a lot of debate about that in the Pathfinder community, but with an epic roll of over 20, I'm pretty sure that even the naysayers will just have to, uh, you know, bear with us. Feel free to move your mount about. Yeah, I'm a little too laggy to move my mount about. It won't let me. All right, so I'll bring you. I'll bring you into play. Here you go. Sweet. So, so importantly, so, stop lagging about. I need your aid. As soon as I come into the room, I'll take a look and and tell everybody, be be still, be still. You may disturb any lingering tracks. Oh, very well. And I will do a survival check. I will aid survival check. Okay. Alcasti, sorry, Alcasti, Romeo, oh. lights a torch oh. and then fumbles about with a light crossbow in one hand. Does he look at all competent with that crossbow? Yes, he does seem to like, you know, cleverly lift a knee, brace it against the wall, you type of thing, but he needs to see what he's doing. So first he goes off of like pulling it out and everything going off of Winston's light. But since everyone's kind of buggered off ahead of him, you kind of see him pull into light where he's, you know, half playing with the torch and half playing with the crossbow. He looks a little bit uh, encumbered since you, you can technically fire a crossbow at negative four with one hand and it'll take you a long time to reload it. But then again, you know, it's not his job to defend you, just probably himself. Is he a danger? Does he look untrained? No, he does look like he has the simple weapon proficiency and can use said crossbow. Okay. If that's what you're worried about. He's I just, just, take, see he's just he's taking a... a little bit extra time fumbling about. So I guess I shouldn't use the word fumble. That's uh, <laughs> That scares us. I do have the critical fumble deck and uh, critical hit deck here in front of me for use, gentlemen. Best mm. of luck. Best of um, luck. So I, uh, I did not do well on my survival check. I got a seven. Mm -hmm. And Sir Bartholomew was of uh, less aid than I anticipated. Okay. Yeah. Um, a low growl ensues from Barkley, but it's more of a, I don't like this place as opposed to, I've found something any points. You know what I mean? It's very damp down here. It's enclosed. The wolf's not very impressed and he's letting you know it. Nobody likes the damp. No one likes the damps. I'm looking at a whole bunch of perception, boys. Okay. And, and Out of five. In, yep. <laughs> five here. That's Lord Gildervath, the perceptive. The perceptive. Uh, I see my torch. You actually hold the torch like right in front of you, so that's all. Oh you my can see god! Is Look at the colors. <laughs> this is not I'm, going well. This is going, going great for me. <laughs> I got a six. Uh huh. Is this a new round round of perceptions? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh my. Perception twelve. I got a nine again. Oh. Yep. A nine again. A yes. ten. Yes. When I'm when I'm done with my eight again, I drink my nine again. <laughs> Bartholomew can barely hear each other, right? and Gildervarth will point towards the double doors that look like they are directly to the east mm -hmm. check those doors and see if they've been used recently Tapo, cover us all uh, Bartholomew you, 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 Winston. you others, move about the cabin alright uh, I'm not seeing Tricky Bartholomew's perception oh 11, okay, I got it here All right. okay uh, I will tell you this, gentlemen, even if it was a relatively easy DC of 10, the sort of tanking and stacking and, you know, we're not exactly doing the silent SWAT team, you know, maybe when you guys are higher oh, level and dude. sort of meet your stride, well, this, there'll be this awesome SWAT team of Cavaliers that stack oh. up on a corner and make stealth hand gestures, not, but yeah, stealth is you guys not all come tromping do, down and ordering each other about. And if there was something to hear, it's pretty much covered by, you know, your, each other. If there's something to see, we have not yet discovered it, but the smell, the dampness is definitely apparent um so at the door uh mm -hmm. the, is the floor covered in dust uh yeah it's kind of dusty down here okay a bit now wet. the door just swing in in or out which side of the hinges is on uh the door is open towards you towards okay so i it all looks look at the ground and just look like the door has swept the floor at all anytime lately survival perception uh, surviving my perception checks. Yes. 10? Yes. Uh, it does look like there's a, a minute trace that the door has been used recently. I think this door has opened recently. Probably by, by the undead. Beware. By the miscreant. <clears throat> oh, Bartholomew, oh, cast those doors open. 
Right. Uh, open, swing open both double doors. Okay. Bam, bam. Exactly. Bartholomew swings open both doors and is immediately met with hostile crossbow fire. We'll see you next time. Gentlemen, roll for initiative and best of luck. Whoops. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> awesome. Oh my. I'm glad.